Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We do apologize. We're a couple of minutes late, a little technical difficulty. I'm Steve Love, President and CEO, Dallas-Fort Worth Hospital Council. We want to thank all of you for participating in this educational webinar, and we're delighted it's hosted in coordination with Abilene Christian University, a very active and supportive associate member of the Hospital Council. Today's topic, Nursing Future, Technology, Opportunities, and Telehealth. You know, for over a century, Abilene Christian University has really served as a hub of academic excellence in serving students throughout Texas. They have excellent undergraduate, graduate programs and equip and empower their students through their exceptional teaching so that they can continue that leadership role in our communities. They do have a North Campus here in Dallas and Addison, and they provide online courses in healthcare and nursing. We're delighted that we've got two excellent speakers today. Catherine Garner, who has a doctorate in public health policy and administration and serves as a nursing professor at Abilene Christian University. We also have with us Rhonda Howard, whose current project is working within the Doctor of Nursing Practice Program at Abilene Christian University on the assessment of veteran satisfaction with telehealth services during the pandemic. This is gonna be a fascinating presentation. So we really are delighted, and it's my pleasure, ladies and gentlemen, to turn this over to Catherine Garner. Catherine? Thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, we're so pleased to be able to share what is really only one part of our doctoral programs course on technology. Um, and so I'm gonna just try to give you a few highlights and cover a few, I think, exciting new developments in technology that will impact us all. And then Rhonda will talk about the consumer satisfaction with this technology, which is key to, to our being able to go forward with telehealth and with the use of technology. The theme for today is really how we adopt this advanced technology into our nursing practice. And one of the issues, but I think very exciting, is the emergence of point of care technology. Um, we're now able to use translation at the bedside with Google Translator. We are not relying on those costly TV programs for education anymore. We can simply pull up our pads and go directly to the appropriate language, the appropriate education level, for all of our patients. We can even use animation, which comes in very handy, particularly with pediatric patients when we're trying to get our points across. The, the large technology in companies, particularly Apple, have invested significantly in this point of care uh, technology. I'm fortunate enough to have a, a son who works at Apple, and so he gets to preview some of these devices, and it really is absolutely amazing how fast this is moving. I was used to a smartwatch that was really just a way to monitor my steps, but it, now the Apple Watch can actually track our daily steps. They can alert us to medications and appointments. They can take our blood pressure and pulse while we're exercising. And Gosh, I mean, I just can't believe how much this is changing. Um, the next, I think, challenge for us all will be how do we integrate this wearable technology into the electronic health record so that as a physician or a clinician in the office, I can pull up and I can look at these vital signs along with the exercise pattern. Think about how that will help us manage um, the care of cardiac patients once they return home. And we tell them to get out and exercise, but we really have no idea um, what is going on besides maybe pulse and blood pressure. 
that use of cloud technology is, is actually, I think, the most promising in terms of tying point of care um, technology into our daily use. In home care, um, I know we, we think about robots and, and we think about the ones in the basement of a hospital that move supplies around, that deliver things to the, the staff um, in their um, automated dispensing machines and that sort of thing. But the use of robotics with artificial intelligence um, has now automated robots to the point that they can dispense medication at specific times in the home. Um, and these medication refills can be sent directly to the home. And it's much like, um, it's kind of like replacing the toner in your, in your uh, computer printer. You just flip out the one, flip in another, and you're all set to go. These programs can also be alerted to um, patients to take their vital signs and to enter, particularly for CHF patients, their weight and, and for diabetics, their glucose level at specific times and actually manage their dosages and their medications using this real-time robot who's there with you. Um, the Japanese are pioneering um, the use of robots as companions for elderly patients in nursing homes and long-term care communities. So if you think about it, um, it's, a, it's a lot like having your pet avatar. Um, and so the, the robot can actually be made to look for a robot or just about anything. And they're beginning to use these in doing rounds actually in hospital settings. So if you really, if you want to know more, I, I can watch um, YouTube videos sometimes for hours, but YouTube videos, if you just click on technology, um, healthcare and Japan, you'll be able to see um, films of what they're doing with this. So wearable technology is actually moving ahead. Um, the health electronics um, actually can, can do auto fibrillations. There are earplugs now to monitor heart rate and respirations. There's headbands for sleep and brain electric, electrical capacity and rings that are much like a smartphone that track the same things as, as your Apple Watch. These are being develop wearable technology for continuous heart and EKG monitoring. And shoes now are being fitted with insoles that can track cadence and balance, which is particularly important, I think, in trauma recovery and in um, recovery centers after stroke. She was actually developed within a government agency called the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. This is a, a rapid incubator for innovation and was the source actually of much of the genome sequencing that is driving our use of artificial intelligence. Virtual tertiary care um, has taken a while to catch on. Uh, we actually started virtual hospital care back in Kansas in the 80s. But at that point in time, the internet technology, the broadband was just not enough and, and the technology itself was actually very, very expensive. Well, now that we can actually do virtual care where somebody in a medical university or a tertiary care with hospitalists and intensivists on staff can have a view into a rural ICU and be monitoring that patient with nurses and physicians there in real time and to recommend interventions in real time. And because there are very, there are very few of them actually, we're having trouble, um, I think, graduating enough intensivists in those that are, are hospitalists. Um, this, is a, this is an important event for particularly rural in critical access hospitals. But the VA was the one that pioneered the concept of hospital at home. 
And if you think about it, many parents uh, with special needs children are sent home with monitors and IV fluids and all of those things. And it can be overwhelming for them. The same uh, technology we use for virtual ICU care can be used in a hospital at home so that you can have the nurse at the hospital or the consulting respiratory therapist or physical therapist on the line and actually show them the monitors, show them the child. This is also very helpful in monitoring palliative care and end of life care where Patients don't want to be in a hospital, but they need some routine monitoring. And that means real-time feedback with someone that can continually monitor where they are. Um, and as builders continue to develop smart homes, think about how this could be um, managed for disability and for illness. My daughter-in-law has um, an app on her phone that when somebody rings the doorbell at her house, she's got a video feed that shows her who's at the door and um, she can talk to them via voice activated video. So I was with them the other day and one of the children's friends showed up and she was able to, to see that it was another child to say to him, we're not home. Um, my son will be home at four o'clock and he'll call you or you can come back at four o'clock. The same technology evolved from those um, thefts that were occurring with the delivery of, of UPS and FedEx boxes where someone rang the door and left the package on the doorstep and thieves have gone up and taken that package. So think about how all of that can change if we have virtual homes for chronic care patients. The other opportunity that is here now, um, I left my, my son at the, I mean, my, my dog at the Redfern Pet Lodge here in Ocala, Florida, where I live. And they offer you uh, access to a secure site where you can have 24 hour monitoring of your, of your pet while you're in long distance care. If you think about one of the agonies with the recent COVID pandemic in nursing homes and long-term care facilities, families couldn't see that their care, their loved one was being cared for. They couldn't, they, the technology of virtual visits was very much um, in its infancy at that period of time. Fortunately, the value of those virtual visits is now morphing into a demand from uh, baby boomers who have parents in those facilities who are wanting to actually being able to monitor mom and dad on a 24 hour basis. So look for this to change um, and, and look for new HIPAA <laughs> regulations around that also. We, we don't think about um, robotics much beyond um, the surgical technology, which has been using surgical tech robots for a long time. They're also used to develop prosthetics. Um, and the VA has been partnering with many large universities. The use of robotic um, arms really to fashion the same kind of things with artificial limbs that can receive sensors and, and activate artificial limbs so that they can move and adapt. Um, so watch for that therapy, particularly for those of you that, that serve our veterans population and for those coming back from our wars abroad. The few of us are, are watching the basic science research that is now resulting in pharmacogenetics, personalized, targeted oncology treatments and rapid, rapid tumor analysis that happening in, octo, in a oncology centers. This is the very same technology that brought us um, rapid testing for pregnancy, for strep, for COVID. And companies like 23andMe now have vast data banks 
of our genetic materials that are licensed to researchers for looking at our genetic materials for disease markers and predictors. Consider where in vitro fertilization is now. I was fortunate enough to um, be on the team at Vanderbilt that started the country's second in vitro program um, back in the 90s. And we had as our scientists, someone who was from Italy, who said his whole thing, his whole motivation for doing research in in vitro fertilization um, was that he eventually hoped that we could take that fetal embryonic tissue, freeze that embryo, type that tissue, test it for diseases like Tay-Sachs and cystic fibrosis, and give the parents the opportunity to say, I want that implanted or I'm not. It look, took a long time and it look, took a lot of genomic sequencing and now we actually have the technology to do that. Like many of our technologies, ethics has not kept pace with where technology has enabled our providers to go. The completion of the human genome, the actual complete map was not completed until earlier this year. So that opens up all kinds of research into um, genetic alterations that can um, prevent the advance of pancreatic cancers, which is one of the more common cancers um, that are deadly. Uh, there was an article in the paper this morning about some gene sequencing that was able to stop um, pancreas in its advanced stages. So if you work in oncology, it, it's an exciting time to see how technology in basic science research is changing our therapeutic approach to pay. So if you <clears throat> go into a patient room, and particularly an ICU room, take a minute to look around at everything that constitutes the use of technology. That includes IV pumps, that includes respirators, that includes heart monitors and pulse oximeters. Um, we also have begun using Voicera, which allows instant communication among nurses on the unit. We um, have limitedly adopted, many of us are, are not are not texters, but have learned to adapt to the use of texting as a way to quickly reach different practitioners in large hospital settings. We have um, bed alarms now to help prevent falls. So if you think about that, all of it is technology. And, and how are those technologies being able to be blended with the point of care technology? in monitoring patients on a universal basis. Well, I was one of the individuals many years ago in my naivete that said, you know, I have, an, I have a plastic ATM card that I can use anywhere in any country in the world. Why can't I have that same kind of thing that I can use when I go from provider to provider? Well, the biggest obstacle and one that is, is still slowing down this integration is that, that competitors in a lucrative field um, seldom have the, this, the things, the incentives to align their systems. So if you're on an Epic or you're on a Cerner, um, those technologies do not interface. And until we find a way to make that happen, and certainly Medicare has done that with their billing, um, we're, we're less likely to have this blending together, all of, our, um, all of our data into mobile health records. And in fact, Google was one of the pioneers in developing this and they quickly called it a day and wrote off that investment. So again, what the cloud is doing where our data is stored, not in our computers, but backed up into a cloud. So if you can upload all that information into a cloud, 
and then integrate it and, and download it. That's what we did for COVID when hospitals were given a unique identifier to report daily to CDC about their number of, number of cases admitted, their number of beds available. Um, that technology came from using one site in the cloud. Obviously, privacy is a big issue. Many people don't want to know their personal data is out there um, floating around in this, this kind of universe that we call um, the cloud. But it's here, it's a, way to, it's a way to use technology in our favor. We don't think much about technology in where it comes from. And I, I read a fascinating article that just opened my eyes um, into the science that is actually coming from the defense agency DARPA and from NASA. It was NASA that first developed the water purification systems that we use in homes and that are used in large bottling plants and, and now are being used to supplement water sources in desert areas. The, the water is not quite safe in many parts of Mexico. And what you have is large desalinization plants that are feeding water into the, the water system. So with global climate change, it's interesting to know that that came from how do we purify water in space? Microwave technology, we all take for granted when we go in the kitchen and, and turn on the microwave. But in fact, that all was developed at NASA. They continue in the International Space Station to develop drugs using protein crystals um, they're testing how to grow food in microgravity, and those techniques are brought back to the Department of Agriculture for research here in looking at our food supply and how best to use a minimum amount of water um, and get the maximum amount of nutrients. They're also testing tissue chips in their astronauts, and the astronauts themselves have been um, studying ways to combat muscle atrophy and bone loss um, because in zero gravity that is accelerated. So they now are using specially adapted fitness um, machines that are being tested along with some of the metabolic changes that go into being in the zero gravity environment. Well most of us are not going to be going into space anytime soon unless you have more dollars um, than that would probably put you in retirement um, or you win the lottery tomorrow. So, but those things are all very applicable to studying how multiple, how muscle atrophy occurs and in prevention and development of, of drugs for bone loss and osteoporosis. There was a lot of research on colloids, believe it or not, and the research at NASA has um, brought in 3D printing, uh, many pharmaceuticals, and has even be done, being done to improve the toothpaste that we use on a daily basis. So let's kind of switch to telehealth right now. Um, again, telehealth has been around for a long time, but it wasn't until cable networks have expanded, we've increased internet speed, and the cost of hardware, frankly, has gone down, that telehealth has expanded to the point that it's been adopted by nursing call centers managed by large healthcare systems and insurance companies for triage and chronic disease management for several years. Um, now, technology is allowing us to outsource radiology imaging, pathology, um, and to do that, and even wound care monitoring with home care patients. So we're able to do that because of the bandwidth, because of the amount of money that's been invested in telecommunications across the world. Certainly, um, we saw with the COVID pandemic, 
um, updates and software um, beginning to be used in individual practices for patient communication, for scheduling, and for the exchange of records and information. It is quite nice to be able to go on and, and click in my personal health record for my primary care physician and say, I need a refill on this prescription and know that that's being picked up almost immediately. And because all of our pharmaceutical prescriptions now go through telecommunications as opposed to the old pad and pen, um, that can happen on a very quick basis. So we're seeing the expansion. Um, but not just in primary care, as we talked about. We're seeing it in homebound care, in management of routine illnesses, and in primary care. With the COVID pandemic, patients really didn't have a choice necessarily if they thought they needed to be seen, other than to go into emergency rooms, and that was greatly discouraged. Many people skip primary care appointments because they didn't want to go into a waiting room full of patients that might be giving them COVID. So telehealth um, is, is helping overcome routine barriers um, such as transportation, um, time away from work, childcare, and waiting room appointments. So all of those things that have been barriers that have been with us for a long, long time are being circumvented by the use of telehealth. Um, it's interesting to see the minute clinics and all kinds of clinics now using telehealth visits routinely from their primary care centers in Walmart and in CVS and Walgreens. So it would be interesting to see how that impacts on the use of emergency care, on how it um, impacts uh, how patients are willing um, to, to use this technology because it's convenient. Um, and, and it's interesting now to go onto the website with uh, two of the large health systems, competing health systems here and down, where they advertise wait towns in their various emergency centers because nobody wants to wait. And this helps with that. They can be planned for. Um, and you have choices for people. And that, that's important. That's very, very important for us all. So, um, I'm going to stop for a second and take a breath, and then I'm going to turn it over to uh, Rhonda Howard. Rhonda, um, I've had the privilege of being her doctoral dissertation chair with her doctoral work at Abilene Christian, and she has done a phenomenal job of mastering all of the information in our program and blending that into a research presentation that she's going to show you today. Well, thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Garner, for uh, inviting me to participate with you today. And I, I want to say thanks to the Dallas Fort Worth Hospital Council for uh, enabling us to present too. Uh, my name is Rhonda Howard. I am a DNP student at Abilene Christian University. And uh, my DMP project is a focus assessment of veteran satisfaction and telehealth services during the COVID-19 pandemic. And my findings uh, were kind of interesting, uh, surprising to me, in fact. Um, I am a practicing NP at the Amarillo VA Hospital, and I work in primary care. So I had a, a great opportunity to, to apply this survey to my veterans to get some feedback on how they felt about telehealth. And I'm gonna ask Dr. Garner to um, advance slides as we go so we don't have to go back and forth with presentations. So if you'll advance, Dr. Garner. Next slide. Sorry, well, it stopped advancing. Okay, Sorry. there we go. 
All right, thank you. Um, the purpose of the study was to evaluate information uh, from veterans who had utilized telehealth services in the last year, that would be during the COVID pandemic, and analyze their perception of satisfaction with services and how they felt about it and how especially how they felt it affected their health status. Gathering data and the analyzing, we find helps shape the healthcare delivery for our future. So I found this a uh, very uh, interesting and an exciting time. Um, in evaluating patient satisfaction is also part of quality improvement measures in healthcare organizations, just like any other business, and it helps set the course for initiating change for the future. Now, I used a quantitative format um, program evaluation of the Amarillo Veterans Affairs Telehealth Services, and I used an approved 2009 Home Telehealth Patient Satisfaction Survey tool, um, so I didn't have to invent a new tool, but I did um, improvise and, and asked um, a, a extra question about age demographics, which happened to be uh, quite uh, interesting findings. Our age uh, question was divided into categories of decades, starting from age 20 to 29, to 30 to 39, and on up until uh, 90 to 99. Um, so um, it was very, very interesting to get those findings. Uh, next slide. We saw and experienced COVID and how it moved many patients away from face-to-face -face visits into a telehealth situation, mm -hmm. mainly due to exposure to safety issues, as Dr. Garner has already mentioned. We also found that there was a clinical gap in practice that existed based on the lack of formative assessment data on patient dissatisfaction with telehealth services, especially during COVID. Now, this data is needed to complete a, a feedback loop as part of a continuous quality improvement incentive. And this is really relevant when we talk about reimbursement with insurances and even Medicare, Medicaid. Um, the World Health Organization even states that the patient is the expert when we measure patient experiences with healthcare satisfaction. So we need to go to them to find out, is this working or is this not? Um, this quantitative survey helped assess data collected for future, future, uh, further analysis and for measuring, in this case, the patient satisfaction perception on the impact of health based on the use of telehealth surveys. We also found that studies conducted prior to COVID-19, that would be prior to, say, 2020, indicated that patients who initially declined telehealth services often voiced some satisfaction when they became more experienced with technology. So it's sort of like the more you use it, the more you're comfortable with it. And it became a, a quick learning curve, and in fact, an accelerated learning curve during COVID uh, for technology users. Next slide. I chose this quantitative uh, uh, program evaluation modeled by a Donabidian model using the telehealth uh, patient survey from the VA and I use Qualtrics, which is an online data collection software provided by Abilene Christian University. Um, I also like it scale one doll set had like or five different um, um, choices. And the data collected was then downloaded onto an Excel spreadsheet. And then these were analyzed through an SBSS software using statistical analysis, ANOVA, um, the Man Whitney, and so on, with different age group uh, uh, analysis of participants. Now, I used approximately uh, 200 potential veterans with 133 responses over about a, a month and a half to two month period. And I used an iPad to collect that data that was approved by the VA. You know, the VA can be kind of picky what you bring into um, their organization. So everything had to be approved. Next slide. Uh, the rankings and findings were 99% of participants agreed strongly that information provided by the care coordinators, which would be like the primary care provider, helped them with health problems. And that's, that's quite a bit, I mean, that was huge. 84% of all participants felt that their technology worked for them in telehealth sessions. 
88.6% agreed their equipment was easy to use, and that equipment varied from patient to patient. Some patients use their iPhone, some patients use it, maybe a flip phone for just a telephone visit. Some of them are set up with an iPad or um, uh, different monitoring devices at home, like um, uh, blood pressure, weights, and things of that nature. 89% of them agree that they made positive changes to their self-care based on their telehealth experience. Another 89% felt they could contact their care coordinators during business hours, which was basically Monday through Friday, eight to five. Roughly 88% felt using telehealth has contributed to making a positive change in their life. And 90% of participants uh, felt that they would recommend telehealth programs for others. So the overall satisfaction findings for telehealth were, were quite uh, high, 84 to 99% positive ratings. And the overall statistical analysis for 50 to 90 year olds indicated a very high uh, perception of satisfaction when compared to their counterparts, the 20 to 49 year olds. So uh, we think of uh, the younger uh, generation as being very technically savvy, um, technology is often their first language, especially the 20, 30 year olds and even 40 year olds, you know, they've been using it for quite a while. So we assumed that their satisfaction would be higher, at least I did. So I was quite surprised. Um, next slide. To find that the highest number of veteran participants were 70 to 79 year olds. And that just happened to be the demographics of patients that uh, were seen during that two month period. But surprisingly, this 70 to 79 year old group who predominantly participated in this survey gave us the highest marks for positive patient satisfaction for telehealth among all veterans of all my patient panels at the VA in Amarillo. So I thought that was quite interesting that we have this older generation that's becoming very, very comfortable with technology. Next slide. So our findings, uh, we got um, my dad upside down there, but <laughs> these <laughs> findings indicated that the telehealth continues to provide a cost-effective means of care. It allows increased capabilities with increased satisfaction rates as reflected by the majority of positive patient satisfaction data for all categories of the survey. And for veteran survey participants, the category of 70 to 79 year olds had the highest percentage of positive responses to the questions provided by the telehealth patient satisfaction survey for this. So um, I, was, I was just really thrilled to get these, um, this data. Next slide. So uh, the summary is the VA continues to offer lots and lots of uh, technology uh, on, on telehealth, uh, via, uh, you know, over the phone, through other programs, and uh, some of these have just begun uh, this year, like Telemove, which is right in the middle of that left-hand side. It's a weight management. I, I have a lot of veterans who complained about gaining a lot of weight, but they couldn't go to our weight reduction program because it was a live um, uh, class. And because of tele, uh, you know, because of COVID, all the tele, a lot of these telehealth programs are moved to a telemove or telenephrology or telenutrition or whatever. And so they found it that it's much more accessible in the convenience of their home. So um, it continues to be a potential tool for reaching out to clients, especially in remote areas. Our veterans have a very high percentage of PTSD. Uh, so they really dislike crowds, they dislike waiting rooms. So this fits great into their lifestyle. Uh, and we found that performing patient surveys regarding telehealth uh, services helped us analyze patients' continued changing perception of the impact of healthcare delivery and how it is perceived and, and how it's making changes in their health status and their quality of life. Bringing attention to patient uh, satisfaction with surveys can be a driving force to modernize telehealth legislation, update reimbursement strategies, as well as improving services, especially to those vulnerable populations. And let's not underestimate the impact that was perceived 
by telehealth services on all populations, including those previously perceived as, as having technological disadvantages due to their advanced age. We're finding that telehealth continues to be transformational. It continues to be robust, sustainable. It is visionary for our future. And it, I think it will modernize healthcare. And as we've found, it's not limited to, to just the young. It can, it, it's kind of starting to uh, embrace all levels, all ages, and um, everyone is becoming much more tech savvy. Thank you all for allowing me to present to you. Now we'll go back to Dr. Garner. Well, thank you, Rhonda. Um, this was just a very brief window into the topics we cover in our telehealth uh, course in the DNP program at Abilene Christian. Uh, we didn't really have time to go deeper into some of the other topics, um, one of which is the use and application of, of apps. Uh, as I mentioned before, my son works at Apple. They are vetting between 10 to 20 healthcare apps per week um, in just the international division. And he said it's probably twice that in the, the um, US division. So tons of things coming out there. Um, one of the things we do with, um, with our class is to have you go out and search for your patient population. And, and discover all the apps and think about the incorporation of that into their care. We didn't have time to talk about big data. Uh, one of the benefits to having electronic health records is that we have now have huge data sets on patients that researchers are using um, to build artificial intelligence into our um, electronic health system. So, you know, honestly, this I, I, clearly I'm excited by by technology in its use, and I, I am um, I am rapidly moving into the cohort that that <laughs> excuse me, Rhonda was talking about, and I do want to reemphasize that older people actually are very technology savvy particularly when they have smartphones or computers. Um, what's, what's pushed many older folks is that they that's the way to talk to their grandchildren now. So they have family Facebook pages. They have um, all kinds of things that, that kids are used to and, and can enjoy playing games with their grandchildren on the network. So, if we consider that, we consider um, the use of gaming technology, which is changing simulation. Uh, we're finding that more and more schools are looking at adding a special certificate in telehealth. Um, so look for that in your future. Um, the DNP program also covers patient improvement and quality and, and safety benchmarking. Um, program evaluation, biostatistics and epidemiology, uh, finance, and leadership skills for the nurse executive. So our emphasis is very much on the use of evidence-based research in daily nursing practice, leadership, and in the management of health systems. We do have continuous enrollment with both a BSN entry and MSN entry points. So please um, go on your Google and go to acu.edu if you want to explore this any further. Thank you. I'm going to open it up to questions now. This is Steve, uh, Catherine, and Rhonda. Thank you so much. Chris is kind of monitoring the questions coming in. You know, there was the OIG Office of Inspector General report that looked at Medicare beneficiaries and over 32 million Medicare beneficiaries from 2020 to 2021 used telehealth because of the pandemic, which uh, was remarkable. So the question we've gotten is, even though you touched on this, 
what percentage of U.S. veterans do you feel currently use telehealth? So um, we have just revamped all of our, uh, our grids for seeing patients on a daily basis, and we are now required to handle 20% of our um, patient visits are supposed to be uh, telehealth related, either phone call, uh, BBC, which is a video conference call, or a, um, uh, you know, some other form of telehealth. Um, there's different levels, but 20% now are using it. But during COVID, uh, um, during the COVID, we were all sent home for six months, and we were expected to work from home. We didn't see any patients face to face during that time uh, at our outpatient clinic. Um, there was one or two doctors that saw walk-ins, and they stayed and only saw urgent walk-ins, but no care. All of that was done online from home on our, most of the time on our personal computers. And uh, so it was 100% for, for me for six months was all telehealth. And then we went back to, you know, slowly uh, evolving back into an integrated um, face to face. And, um, and now we're to a minimal of 20%. But like I said, we have uh, probably almost 50 programs now. Um, I think I showed 38 all ago. And we have so many of them now that are telehealth related. You know, um, many of the people that are participating on this webinar know at their institutions and many work in provider settings uh, the importance of telehealth. And we know that broadband has been a real issue, especially in socioeconomic areas where you have the social drivers of health. Based on y'all's experience, could you talk about common barriers in telehealth when used by patients? <clears throat> Dr. Garner, you want to take part of that? Um, absolutely. Um, as you said, um, rural areas often don't have the broadband connections that many of us in urban areas do. That is changing rapidly in the Biden administration as part of their infrastructure bill actually had a lot of money in it towards expanding um, internet access to everyone in the U.S. And that said, um, everyone has, a, I swear everyone has a smartphone. Um, I go in the grocery store and people's looking at their lists on their smartphone. And, and I, I live in Florida. We have a significant older retired community here and they are very technology savvy. So I don't see that as, as the barrier that it used to be. Um, and, and if you look at Africa, Africa has pioneered the use of, of telehealth and smartphones. It's, you know, a lot of them do not have, um, you know, if you think about South Africa, I mean, those are huge remote rural areas and you can't provide broadband to all of that, but everybody has a smartphone and they're, you know, they're less expensive than they used to be. There's limited data plans. So I think that's becoming less of a barrier as technology moves ahead. Um, Ronnie, you want to talk about some of the practical barriers? Well, like for some of my old patients, they have flip phones. My father, uh, who is mine, I had to get him to change to an iPhone. We've offered to purchase him one. He's just not interested. Um, but he does have a flip phone, and he uses it almost as well as an iPhone. So I'm, I'm always kind of um, laughing at uh, his his uh, technology um, curve also. Uh, but, you know, we're, we're providing, I think, more uh, tablets, more computers, more, I mean, the VA actually provides some veterans with telephones if they do not have a homeless population or whatever. If they do not have a telephone available, they will provide them one, you know, um, given certain criteria. So I think that that barrier wall is moving pretty rapidly. And I think COVID uh, was a, a big game changer with a lot of that. Now we're seeing the cost of gas. 
and people don't want to drive, you know, 100 miles to go see their doctor and 100 miles home. So I think we're going to see even more uh, patients sign up for telehealth care and, you know, uh, try it out for the first time. And then once they, they get it, and they, you know, uh, I think that they're going to use it more and more. Good, good points. We, we have another question. Um, what are some of the legal concerns or concerns you see around ICU from home and other similar care models? You know, um, our, our vision of HIPAA and uh, privacy has expanded greatly from the initial legislation. We used to think of it as you've got to close your computer screen and, you know, you don't give out confidential patient information. You don't go into somebody else's medical records. Um, that is one of the big concerns that technology companies are having to address. And cybersecurity has become, I think, the leading issue for technology companies and for, well, hospitals. We, we see computer hacking going on into hospital systems. So we had one hospital here in, in uh, Florida that was held up for ransom by compromising their computer system. So it, cybersecurity is, they're on it, um, but they've got to be a step ahead of their hackers. That's really, I think, the major legal risk. Um, Many physicians um, talked about malpractice and the, their lack of being able to touch the patient. Well, a lot of patients, you know, short of their annual physical, um, you know, somebody listening to their heart and lungs don't really need a full examination. And as I said, with rapid um, strep tests that hopefully will be available over the counter, um, a mom can go to Walgreens, have her kid tested for strep, and, and via their consulting physician, uh, get her medication right there and then, instead of having to wait uh, with that. That creates its own problems with the antibiotic overuse, but it's one way to deal with it um, by saying you don't have strep, you don't need medicine, um, as opposed to now where um, oftentimes we give antibiotics just because, just because. Right. Good answer. And thanks for addressing the malpractice side as well as the private security side. You know, we've talked a little bit about veterans. We've talked some about uh, Medicare recipients. As we look at some of the younger people, uh, you touched on this in your presentation, but video gaming, and video gaming technology. Mm -hmm. From where both of you sit, how does that fit into healthcare technology? From the education standpoint, and I'll let Rhonda talk about the clinical standpoint, from the education, you know, we were spending thousands of dollars on mannequins um, to do simulations. And, and that's, expensive technology it's difficult sometimes to program and and it's not as easy to throw different um different things into the mix that that are really high risk but very low volume which is what we have to train our providers to do so i see in another over the next 10 years our simulation being changed to a gaming scenario much like they use in the Air Force um, and the Navy to, to train their soldiers and sailors on, on how to react in a battlefield situation that changes instantly. I think that's the biggest thing on the education side. Uh, Rhonda, what do you think about the patient side? Well, you know, I was just sitting here think, listening to you and remembering I recently did a um, refresher for ACLS and you know 20 years ago which I'm telling my age now but when we did uh, ACLS it was with a panel of you know seven professionals they all drilled you over a 
two day period, I mean, you felt just pretty uh, exhausted after taking that course. You felt like you knew it, but it was very stressful. And um, now you take an ACLS course and mini courses, uh, and it's like a, it's almost like a video game. You tell them where to put the electrolytes, that you tell them to wear, you know, you do it all by almost like a game-like, you know, technology. And uh, that's how we take our continuing ed courses now for ACLS, BLS, you know, CPR. And uh, think about how that may change. We can put that out into the, um, you know, the general population. We can teach people CPR by having them, you know, go through a, a format online, which we're seeing that more and more. I think that's been pushed out, you know, the last 10 years or so, but it is, it's just been, you know, quite interesting to me and another learning curve because you have to learn how to navigate that technology. And uh, as far as healthcare, um, you know, we're seeing a lot more um, patients in CBOX, which are the community-based outpatient um, hospitals, and we're able to have a maybe an LVN there or an EMT that puts the um, uh, the stethoscope on the heart, we can listen to heart sounds, we can do all of this through almost like a gaming technology again, and breath sounds, um, you know, it's just, it's just amazing. Plus, you know, the video, you can look at feet, you can, uh, you know, have, tell the person what to do, and they just perform the function for you, but you can see everything and hear everything, so it's been great. Well, we're approaching the top of the hour, and we can't thank you, Catherine and Rhonda, enough. What a great presentation. Thank you for taking time to answer the questions. For the people that are participating, this has been recorded, will be sent out tomorrow to all registrants. But on behalf of everyone, Catherine, Rhonda, job well done, and we thank you and Abilene Christian University for the support you give the Dallas-Fort Worth Hospital Council. And we hope everyone has a good day. Thank you very much.